thank you, Madhavan, uh, uh, Anu Pratap and Jay, my other two colleagues and the two panelists. Uh, I had planned to speak on a different sort of uh, thematic structure, but I think that uh, characteristic, really, Bhanu Pratap, you have given enough, uh, enough issues and uh, enough thoughts to at least, uh, in the first part of what I intend to say, make uh, some prefatory comments on some of the uh, very important issues uh, which uh, you have raised, Bhanu Pratap. There is no doubt, of course, which you have conceded that uh, we are a functioning anarchy. And the fact that parliament has been uh, chaotic and other institutional behavior has also been uh, contributory to this chaotic process. Nonetheless, uh, governance in the very mechanical sense of the term has continued to keep on moving. And therefore, that is why India has been described uh, by so many people as a truly functioning anarchy long before parliament had become so disruptive as it has become increasingly in the last few years. I have broadly uh, two, three other observations to make before I come to uh, the central fact of what I intend to say today. First, I think, Bhanu Pratap, one thing which I would have wanted you to perhaps say is that a lot of what has happened is a result that as long as you have the governance rubric based on what may be called a, a absolute cold-blooded calculus of numbers, as long as the skewed issues of being in office or not is the product of a cruel calculus of numbers, you'll get certain very inevitable consequences flowing out of it. As long as governments have to survive to remain in office by virtue of having a vote of five this way or that from a party which would be nondescript and of comparative irrelevance in the overall arithmetic of numbers. And as long as governments have to depend on the goodwill and the support in this manner, you will have the first contradiction emerging, which is that these parties will exercise influence on policy making which is disproportionate to what their representation would do. Indeed, Many things which you have said, Bhanu Pratap, is the direct product of that. You'd like, you mentioned about 2G in uh, several times. Indeed, it is dominant in our psyche of what happened in 2G, not only in terms of the financial malfeasance brought out by the CAG report and so on, but the fact that a lot of this permissively continued and could not be nipped in the bud was directly the product that the government was dependent on the support of one of the coalition partners who it is said by the hindsight was a beneficiary of whatever happened in the issue of 2G. You have other examples of that. So as long as therefore the parliamentary structure revolves on the survival of not, on this issue of a cruel calculation of numbers for its purposes of survival, you will have certain aberrations which will flow out of it. Indeed, we need to study the political and economic cost of governments based on a system of coalition politics which is dependent on the structure which is there. Indeed, suggestions which were made by many constitutional amendment bodies by the last one which was set up under Mr. Vajpayee, the famous Venkatachalaya Committee report, which of which Soli Swarabji was an important member, had something to do with it, I was secretary to prime minister at that time, is the fact that uh, governments will not automatically fall on this cruel calculation of numbers till an alternative government 
was not put in place. Uh, examples were quoted of what happens, for instance, in Germany and so on, and other kinds of functioning democracy. But of course, uh, as characteristically happens, before this report was uh, taken up for any serious consideration, the Vajpayee government went. And indeed, that is the fate of most committees. And it is indeed the for, uh, fate of the two important uh, constitutional reforms. The first one I remember was done by Mrs. Indira Gandhi under the chairmanship of late Vasan Sate. And she was accused that she was wanting a presidential model and the government changed and the report happily gathered dust. About the report of Mr. Vajpayee since he went, it was said that this was designed primarily for Mr. Vajpayee to assume presidential authority, and that is also happily gathering dust. So I think this is one issue we need to discuss, or whether we need a basic rethink on this particular model of governance, which is based on this kind of a skewed reliance on a cruel calculation of numbers. The second uh, point which I intend to, um, intend to and, and a lot of what I mentioned is really a product of that. I agree with you, uh, Bhanu Pratap, in regard to the, in regard to primacy of parliament being reasserted and the superintendence of parliament over the working of the executive being reestablished. And for that, the need, the need to visit some of the constitutional bodies. Indeed, if you look at the aberration in which, apart from the constitutional bodies, we have created quasi-judicial authorities. I post-1991, I hold myself personally responsible for having played a role in the creation of one or two of them, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, the Electricity Regulatory Authority of India, as a precursor to many of these authorities which were created. This was done primarily with the intention that if you wanted economic liberalization and you wanted level playing field with the private sector, you needed to take these functions away from purely the executive domain to the domain of a quasi-judicial authority, which would be a better arbiter and a better empire and a better judge to ensure level playing field between uh, government and the private sector. But I would go further to from where um, Man Pratap left, that not only the bodies which are enshrined in the constitution could have overstepped, perhaps, the limits and mandate to undercut parliamentary authority, but parliament over the last 20 years has itself enacted many more quasi-judicial bodies which also, in a certain sense, do precisely the same, undercut the functioning of parliament and undercut the superintendence which it is expected to have. To give an example now, for instance, it is imp impossible to discuss issues relating to the working of an electricity regulator. It's impossible to discuss issues on many important issues relating to the telecom sector because these are expected to be performed by the quasi-judicial function, which by separate acts of parliament have now been given to quasi-judicial entities. Is this a drift in the right direction or the wrong direction? I think the jury is out on that one. But it does look to me that the check and balances which are inherent in the working of any government system or any government department, these checks and balances, which are subject to parliamentary scrutiny, are really, if you enact these bodies by separate acts of parliament, become, in a certain sense, outside parliamentary scrutiny. Sure, it is possible, technically, for the functionaries of these constitutional bodies to be called up before different standing committees of parliament, or before, for instance, the Public Accounts Committee, of which uh, I have been a member for the last several years. But I do not remember, except on two occasions, when the telecom authority chiefs, the present and the previous ones, were called for deposing on the issue of making certain recommendations on the 2G functioning. The kind of perfunctory outcome 
of such examination did not leave a very happy picture as far as the Public Accounts Committee was concerned. And as uh, Bhanu Pratap has rightly mentioned, the report of that Public Accounts Committee on the 2G has yet to see the light of the day. So I think that this entire issue of constitutional bodies, new quasi-judicial structure which have been created in the last 20 years for a different purpose of trying to have a smooth transition to a liberalized economy in order to really have a level playing field between public and private sector requires, in my view, a fundamental visit and a fundamental rethink. Third, I think that the issue of whether parliamentary disruption is really now become a kind of an axiomatic reflex. You know, I think that when parliament was being systematically uh, disrupted over the past few years, many of us have questioned really the wisdom of doing so. And the kind of electoral fallout with such a behavioral pattern would influence the electoral psyche. But I think that looking at the outcome of many elections, particularly the more recent one, one could draw the unhappy conclusion that in some way or the other, far from being any punishment for this kind of a disruptive behavior, perhaps the disruptive behavior helped in carrying the message of the failure of governance in multiple ways and the electoral outcomes would certainly not act as a disciplining rod to members of parliament wanting parliamentary performance to be less disruptive and wanting really a more parliamentary structure functioning in a regular kind of way. In this sense of the term also, what uh, Vanu Pratap said, I'm in agreement with uh, what he has said or whether if disruptions are going to become a regular habit. And how do we really begin to find coherence and a consensus within this increasingly disruptive pattern is going to be a challenge which parliamentarians are going to face increasingly and certainly in the very near term. My fourth broad issue is that quite apart from what may be regarded as episodic, what could be regarded perhaps as an aberration recently, which we have mentioned, particularly in the term of the last, in the term of the last Lok Sabha, in terms of the decline in the number of productive days of business, a decline in the functioning of legislative action, decline in the manner in which standing committees have functioned, decline in multiple parameters by which the, the legislature is, can be qualitatively or even quantitatively assessed. Quite apart from this, and if you regard this particular uh, uh, 15th Lok Sabha to be an aberration and therefore view this to be an episodic series of events, there are in my view, and that's my main point, that has the Indian procedures and practices in terms of what the constitution has provided, has it adapted itself to the increasing growing challenges of our time and has it kept pace with best parliamentary practices elsewhere in the globe? My answer to that is a resounding no. That perhaps our constitutional procedures and our processes have remained for far too long frozen, not to really readapt itself or reinvent itself to meet the growing economic and social challenges which confront us. The most telling example of this, as far as I am concerned, is the superintendence of parliament on the financial sphere and the influence which parliament has in terms of the shaping of important economic and financial policies. Budgets are presented to parliament on a particular day in February and that budget, the parliament has no idea of the budget which is likely to be presented that on that particular day, it learns of what the government has in mind. And then, of course, the options before any parliament are really to either approve the budget in totality, 
or approve it with such small tweaking as the government may finally accept in the context of any parliamentary debate, or then the government falls. So I think that the only two options which are then left to parliament is either to accept really the budgetary proposals which are before parliament or to face political instability in terms of the government having to fall in case what in the Westminster model is classically described as a money bill, government falls on the basis of that money bill. Look at the following other options which exist in other democracies of the world. In no other democracy, expenditures, large expenditures, outgoes from the Consolidated Fund of India, and what is characteristically described as a demand for grants, is ever put forward before in the legislature before a very wide-ranging public debate on this issue, and before having taken the legislature into advanced confidence on the possible options and possible outcomes of that particular budgetary proposal. Indeed, if you look at the OECD's guidelines on transparency in budget making and transparency in budgetary appropriations, it gives a pretty wide range of options which government has before firming up a particular demand for grant or a particular outgo from the Consolidated Fund of India. Now, typically what happens in the Indian case is that the expenditure secretary around the time of September, October begins to look at the expenditure outcomes for that particular year, for that particular outgo and expenditure. The expenditure budget is frozen by the time it is the end of November. Parliament sees this in terms of the 29th of February when the budget is presented as part of the expenditure budget of the government. Parliamentary involvement, parliamentary engagement, in any process prior to the firming of this expenditure proposal is next to negligible till Parliament sees this on one particular day. Similarly, when it comes to taxation proposals, indeed, I can understand that there is a speculative impact on excise and customs, perhaps. Any prior knowledge could have an influence on speculative behavior. But in regard to direct taxes, there is no debate in public domain, particularly in Parliament, before the taxation proposals are firmed up. You look at any other democracy in the world, taxation proposals are subjected to deep scrutiny by different wings of the legislature before this proposal begins to get firmed up and sees the actual effort of government in seeking the legislative passage of these taxation proposals. So I do not think that Parliament and parliamentary practices and procedures have kept pace with the manner in which we decide on budgetary appropriation, on demands for grant, and on, for instance, on taxation proposals. Let me give you a bizarre example of what this could amount to. It amounts to the fact that we have often discussed in the Business Advisory Committee of, Parliament, of the Rajya Sabha that, look here, the India's five-year plans, which lays out India's economic strategy for the five years following, does not have a parliamentary discussion of one day. The 12th five-year plan, whose happily we are now in the third year of the implementation of that plan, has not been discussed, either in the Lok Sabha or in the Raj Sabha, for even one full hour. Efforts by many members of parliament that why don't you at least have one day's discussion on what really represents the five-year economic strategy of government in parliament does receive uh, the support, but parliament has not formally one day discussed a five-year economic strategy of what the government and the executive intends to do. There cannot be a bigger failure of superintendence over the working of the executive is a five years economic strategy, which, by the way, I must say, forecloses government's revenue for five years. I mean, after all, if the gross budgetary support of the Planning Commission to implement a five year document really constitutes the bulk of the foreclosure of government's resources in an ex ante sense of the term, as without 
parliamentary approval or parliamentary authorization. Perhaps the aberration of having five-year plans is an aberration much after India's constitution was firmed up and the Planning Commission itself, a non-statutory, a non-constitutional body functioning with an extra-constitutional authority, and I say this with some feeling having been a member of the Indian Planning Commission, to realize that uh, what a non-statutory and a non-constitutional body that is. But the fact remains that that body forecloses India's economic resources for the next five years with zero parliamentary sanction, excepting in an ex post sense of the term, when the demand for grants comes up really, you see what is decided for health or for education for that particular year. Yes, the example is given that it, after all it goes to the standing committee, but in the standing committee what happens? In the standing committee there is no adversarial examination. And that's my other point, that government is not subjected to any adversarial examination the PRS, which uh, runs an excellent system or ran an excellent system of uh, having LAMP fellows, uh, the legislative assistant, which, uh, which I benefited greatly from, I benefited equally from having these very bright, uh, 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 bright legislative assistants, is really, uh, really their imaginative way of trying to help members of parliament. But the f in a formal sense of the term, unlike in the US Senate, and the US Congress and other democracies for examining the proposals in the standing committee. You are examining the very proposals with officials who have made that. So there is no outside adversarial examination of proposals which have been firmed up by government and you have little or no option but to make some suggestions but in the end to approve the proposals which have been made. Therefore I think that I have just given a few examples that parliamentary systems, parliamentary procedures and modalities of scrutiny have not kept pace with the changing challenges of economic and social issues since the inception of the constitution. And I think that the more examples we see, in every nook and corner we find examples of where parliamentary superintendents has really receded over a period of time. Take, for instance, the example of public-private partnership. This is a completely new animal, which has come as an important tool in the hands of policy makers. Public-private partnership is not subjected to any parliamentary scrutiny whatsoever, because this is a completely new animal, which has cropped up at the end of the 10th five-year plan. And yet, it forecloses large public resources, it receives large support from the government in its multiple policies, both on the fiscal and the non-fiscal side. I think that the PRS uh, would do all of us service to bring out, for instance, the kind of changes which are necessary in traditional parliamentary processes and procedures to ensure the superintendence of parliament and what Bhanu Pratap very rightly described as the supremacy of parliament in reigning in the executive receives attention on considering some of the challenging issues which I have raised. Thank you.